You're listening to the Unsure Entrepreneur Podcast with Roger Pierce. Whether you're scribbling business ideas on a napkin or wrestling with the should I, shouldn't I question, get ready to explore the realities, the risks and the rewards of entrepreneurship as we share the stories, scars and successes of small business owners. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Unsure Entrepreneur Podcast. Nice to have you here. I'm Roger Pierce, your host. Thank you for joining us. And I'm so excited today to have our uh, friend and colleague, Nate Simpson. Hello, Nate. Hi, Roger. Thank you so much for taking the time, my friend. Thank you for the invitation. It's been great to, to reconnect after a few years and uh, glad to have the opportunity here to, to chat a little bit about entrepreneurship. Absolutely. We're going to dig into your journey into this crazy world we call self-employment. <laughs> Nate Simpson is a seasoned business development professional with over 25 years of experience in engineering and business development, specifically in the protection and building codes sectors. He has served in significant leadership roles and founded recently Nate Simpson Business Development Company, focused on strategic growth and client engagement within the architecture, engineering, and construction sectors. That's awesome. So, I mean, my first question is just to give it more context, because I want people to understand, you know, what your business is all about before we talk about your journey. Can you tell me more about what you do and who you're serving? To skip stones quickly across the pond, I help clients in the architecture, engineering and construction sectors to make more money and to retain existing clients. That is through examining their processes, structures, their culture related to their business development practices. That's about as concisely as I can I can put it. That's a great, a very concise answer. So give me an example. Can you elaborate on the types of clients you're working with? One engagement has been with a small specialized engineering company led by two partners and about a dozen staff when I started with them. And they were looking for some assistance in, in regard to taking a look at their own existing structures and processes relative to business development and how that might be able to amplify all the great work that the team was already doing and perhaps uncover new opportunities for additional client engagement, additional efficiencies internally by examining their deeply their processes and seeing where they could be more efficient, say, in, in proposal production processes and other things like that. That's uh, been a long term sustained engagement covering uh, initial audit phase with a report and recommendations, and then providing assistance to develop implementation plans related to those recommendations, and then help them get on with the doing of the work. And in another engagement, uh, which focuses more on very targeted and specific sort of a la carte menu options, uh, if you will, an engagement with another engineering company in the fire protection engineering sector to examine some of their internal processes as well, and working with the partners there to help uh, to help address, to help uncover opportunities to, again, do things more efficiently in regard to their business development and, and, and broad-based marketing uh, processes. Wow. So you're helping people with a, a lot of different things, a lot of companies with a lot of different things. And, and why, why do you think they're coming to you? I think in, in part, it's because of a few different factors. One is that I come from a technical background. So I was, uh, to expand on, a little bit on that, I was involved in the fire protection industry for about 27 years. And the first 17 of that was on the technical side, dealing with fire codes and building code applications and helping architects, other engineers, developers, owners, understand what they need to do uh, in order to comply with the fire protection and life safety requirements of codes, uh, re- whether it be uh, for a new design or renovation retrofit uh, or some issue with the ongoing operation of a, of a building. So I have that as my, my background. And then about 10 years ago, 11 years ago now, I had the opportunity uh, with, with one company I was employed with, LRI Engineering, to get into a business development role. And that was as manager of business development. It really provided great opportunity to explore my curiosity with business development. I have a bit of an entrepreneurial itch to scratch, but uh, always been a bit risk averse to to test it out. So it gave me a, at least an opportunity to add something else to my career, a new way to engage with clients. And so 
there was a lot of great learning and experience there over 10 years in, in that role that really sort of made it clear that in the, for me in, in around March 2022 that, that this is what I wanted to do uh, full time. So let's dig into that a bit, because, you know, when I met you and uh, full disclosure, I met, met Nate, we were members of, of, of Toastmasters and we had lots, lots of times there together. When I met Nate, when he had this job at the previous company, and then now I'm coming to you and you've, you've been in business now for, I guess, two years. Exactly. Right. Coming up on two years in July. Yeah. So I want to, you know, explore that journey because. People who are listening are on the fence about self-employment and maybe they, like you, two years ago, had a job and then something happened, whether they followed a, an itch they couldn't resist scratching or they, they, they got you know downsized or whatever. People have different reasons for getting into entrepreneurship. So I want to probe a bit. Can you share why you made this decision to get your own business? And, and again, as I alluded to in my prior comments there, and part of my prior comments, I've always been a little bit risk averse or not even a little bit, <laughs> quite risk averse. So any career move that I did make uh, up to then was always with ink dried on a contract in hand. Uh, <laughs> I knew where I was going next. As 2022 began, and, and I really felt the need that, uh, that there is something else needed, I didn't have a clear picture of what that exactly was going to be. So when I took the decision to leave in March of 2022, I was really open to different possibilities in a way that I hadn't been before. Also, with the benefit of having quite a, uh, developed quite a wide network of contacts and, and uh, uh, mentors, I had the benefit over April and May of having quite a number of discussions with various contacts to help, to help me sort of sift through in this time where I was decompressing from my, my prior engagement, my prior employment, and then just really trying to find what was true for me again. So with the benefit of time and, and those conversations I, I spoke of, what really came true was that, yeah, uh, the passion is business development. And in addition, that what I felt I would enjoy is the opportunity to have variety. And perhaps there was a way to make those things come together in the way that I could help different organizations with business development, be able to get a window into their operations and perhaps uh, help uh, them uh, in some beneficial way. So let me make sure I got this right. Your previous job before the business, you were in business development. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Right. You were doing business development there. So now... Rather than take another job doing business development for someone else, you said, you know what, I can do this as an independent, enjoy the variety of a number of different companies and do it that way. That was the appeal? Yes. Yeah. And as, I, as that picture was developing more and more, you know, obviously doing all the necessary things of doing the market research and qualifying what your market base is and who your ideal customer is and your customer personas and, and all of that good stuff. What I found was that there was actually a real appetite for and need for that sort of third party assistance that can come into an organization that's perhaps a smaller scale professional services firm, maybe five, even, you know, in, in fact, I'm helping a sole proprietor architect right now. So as few as one person, but five to 10 to maybe 20, 25 staff that are seller doer led uh, and that might sound like a bit of a jargony thing right now but uh, but that's um, essentially where the the principles of the firm are the ones that secure the work and and are part of the doing of the work in addition to the other staff members and the team but that they don't otherwise have a dedicated uh, business development or or marketing position on staff however they see the need and the benefit of having one and oftentimes too the, the part of what's part of the calculus is the ability to afford a full-time role. So if in some way with my background, which includes technical uh, service delivery as well, so I understand that aspect, and as well, uh, you know, the business development experience can help serve and provide some support to, to those types of organizations in a way that's meaningful for them, then that's uh, really even narrowing in a bit perhaps too much but uh, but that's what uh, i i determined was my ideal 
client base. You're touching on so many of my favorite themes there. So A, you're hyper-focused on a sector. You're hyper-focused on a, on a service you're providing, outsourced business development for smaller operations that can't don't have the bandwidth to pull it off internally or maybe are growing but not quite ready to hire a full-time person yet, so they hire you kind of thing, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, I know you, you're very thorough. You researched the hell out of this <laughs> <laughs> because I want to go back to what you said a while ago. You, you are risk adverse, right, for your own admission. And that's such a big thing, Nate. That's probably the biggest thing that holds back entrepreneurs. So maybe we could talk about that. You know, how did you, being admittedly risk adverse, how did you deal with that? Well, it's by looking at what scares me most (laughs) and seeing how I can wrestle that down. What is it about a factor, whether it's a financial factor? It was well well, uh, taken care of by LRI. Great firm, does uh, amazing work in the fire protection engineering space. And so, you know, there is a financial, a fiscal impact there. So how to wrestle that down? I have the benefit of having a lot of different colleagues that also do similar work to what I do with other uh, points of focus as well. You know, some might see as my competitors. I see them actually as my colleagues and, and peers in the industry. But how do I wrestle that down? How do I find a positioning that's that's attractive to a potential prospect? And then you get into discussions about, well, what is it about me that could, you know, I guess stumbling through an answer to to get to that uh, often used phrase of imposter syndrome. Like, could this actually, like, who's going to buy me, buy into me? So there's a lot of that, you know, wrestling through, but just trusting in the experience that I had, trusting in the mentors and my network and trusting in the vision that I saw helped minimize that sort of anxiety or risk base to a point of, I don't want to say comfort, but to a manageable level. And as well, uh, you know, I have to acknowledge uh, my wife, Tara. Uh, She's been running her own business for 17 years. And so there is uh, a lot. She's a mentor of mine, uh, just in terms of how to set up and establish uh, your own business. You know, seeing um, the the challenges and the opportunities that that she's had as part of her journey in in entrepreneurship with her own business in in the nutrition uh, as a registered nutritionist, a personal coach, uh, certified personal trainer, endurance athletics coach, and that whole realm. Obviously, very different from architecture, engineering, and construction, but but the thematic principles underpinning entrepreneurship are the bridge there. Being able to sort of lean on her for you know a lot of different input in a way to be very honest and transparent, getting the the permission to take this risk. If only for hearing it from her myself, that this was something that um, would be very beneficial for me in a lot of ways. And that um, clearly I had a passion for uh, an idea that this could work. And then that last little helpful push, helpful push from, from Tara there to say, yeah, let's, let's do this. What a great partner. Now I know she helped you as well. Probably now that I know she was a, she's a trainer and nutritionist, she probably helped you with your triathlons. Oh yes. Uh, Yeah. And triathlons (laughs) and (laughs) marathons and all of that. Yes. Yeah. Not just in business. She, she's, she's a good partner all around. Well, that's very interesting. And again, another theme. So both of you now self-employed, wow. Double jeopardy. I know what you do to, you know, mitigate that uncertain cash flow. Going into a business, did you save up money? Did you use the money from your previous your severance? What did you do to kind of smooth the path, the connection between the the two? In terms of the financial aspects, can't speak too much of how things wrapped up with the previous employer, but uh, but all of this to say that it uh, that was something that still took a, a good depth of discussion with Tara uh, from a from a financial perspective. It was in fact me leaving, making the decision to to leave LRI. That was a factor in the compensation side of things, uh, to be certain. But what weighed heaviest in the balances <laughs> uh, that I was contemplating was that there was just something that I needed that was just different from where I was at. And in the examination of the financial trade off versus, say, you get into factors of, of health in various respects that also come into play. It's not just about uh, financial, um, you know, the financial picture. Financial picture is important. You have to have a roof overhead, 
food in the fridge and your health overall, you know. That's interesting. Just to dwell on when you say health, you mean like a mental health, stress, the job could be stressful, any job. Yeah, to again to just be as open and transparent as possible. Yeah, it was physical health, mental health, and that played a significant factor in, in my decision. Wow, that's great. I don't get to hear that very often, but it's so important that you said that. And thank you for sharing it. You know, the job can be stressful. And maybe you're just tired of doing it for whatever reasons. People need to move on. So all these things, I'm so curious about them that are factors in people's decision about jumping in and moving ahead. But you'd left the job knowing you were going to start a business, right? There wasn't a period of limbo, like, oh, what am I going to do now? There was a period of, of limbo, yes. I know I described it and, and just uh, in case I wasn't clear previously. So I left in March of 2022. My The lights on Nate Simpson Business Development turned on in, in, in July of uh, 2022. So there was, uh, you know, April and May where I was doing uh, that intensive sort of examination and, and discussions with my network and mentors just to see what would be possible, different options that I was contemplating. It wasn't one day leave LRI and then the next day start up Nate Simpson Business Development. There was a period of time of, of examination just to see again in this period where I was, um, say, I'll say decompressing from the, the previous employment just to see what was what was true for me. And again, that, that settled out on the business development side and, and, and ultimately uh, the thought that uh, I would really enjoy that aspect of variety that comes with helping different organizations with their business development needs. Yeah, and you saw your wife doing it, right? She was a bit of a role model probably. And Absolutely. But working that long, you've got lots of connections and, and, and networks and, you know, the old expression, your, your network is your net worth. But that's proving a bit true for you because it's allowed you to get some of those client leads going, right? Absolutely. And it was foundational in terms of being able to be connected with Colin Lobo, the president and partner of Lobo Consulting, my first and to this point longest client. So it was through uh, my network that I was uh, put in touch with Colin. And then, you know, after some discussions, Colin and I and Colin's uh, business partner, uh, Arash Mera, took the decision to to get into an engagement. And that's been similar to my other engagements have come through my my networks. Your advice to entrepreneurs is grow your network. <laughs> Absolutely. And and be curious. That's a big thing for me. I love having the opportunity now to to really dive into things. Uh, even if it doesn't it doesn't even necessarily need to translate into a business or, or a contract for me. I'm just curious about many different things in 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 the sectors in which you know, I specialize, but then other ones that, that feed into the architecture, engineering, and construction sectors. That's what I've often said that. Running a business, you'll learn more in the first six months running your own business than you will six years on a job. There's so much to do, the marketing, the selling, the accounting, the replacing the toner cartridge and the printer, all this stuff. It's up to you now. That's Part of the thing that people love about being self-employed, but also part of the thing that scares people because, oh my God, now I have to do all the marketing and the selling. And fortunately, the selling part is good for you. But for a lot of people, that's the, the scariest role. And heck, even for me. <laughs> so, uh, and it's something that I haven't spent a, a second looking back and, and regretting the decision, though. There's been a, a lot of learnings, uh, you know, and, and challenges. You know, it's it's not all um, rainbows and unicorns <laughs> Rainbow. and just taking those challenges as, as learning opportunities. And, and as I say, you know, engaging with that, um, keeping that uh, spirit of curiosity at the forefront. How are you investing in yourself? You say there's challenges. I remember at well, Toastmasters, that was investing in yourself. Are you doing any training or skills development or things you want to learn? You know, it's been a longstanding engagement uh you know i'm a member of a group called the society for marketing professional services and that is yeah and that is an organization uh, based out of the us but with a chapter in ontario that caters specifically to uh, business development and marketing professionals in the architecture engineering and construction sectors that's been a, a group that i've been a part of since around 2016 2017 and it was so beneficial to me to have found that group and engage with them and the professional development that they offer to help brush up 
skills in, in marketing and business development that I needed to learn when I when I made that transition from technical to uh, business development capacity to have the benefit of uh, developing you know further connections in marketing and business development and principles and leadership elements of of architecture engineering and construction sector firms that community was invaluable to me being uh, and, and remaining part of that community is invaluable to me both from personal perspective, professional perspective, and as pertains to, to the point that you raise about professional development. That's a good tip. Get out there, get plugged in, join your industry groups. Not only is it uh, building you up professionally, but building you up business-wise, I guess, with some leads and connections. This is so important. This is all good stuff entrepreneurs need to hear, you know? So I was going to ask you a question. How, two years in, how has being in business for yourself changed you at all? Do you think it's changed you? I would say it hasn't changed the core of me. It's it's certainly helped to to regulate some of my uh, uh, I'll say more challenging traits in, in terms of anxiousness and and so on. That uh, just again having uh, the focus of being able to focus on business development specifically, and as well being able to focus on having a mix of work types and client engagement types that engages me substantially and also in in different ways that uh you know there's always that you know excitement there when i'm helping my clients and helping them uncover learnings about their own organization or you know the opportunity that i get to learn about say security the security industry in depth from my clients um you know or the architecture the ins and outs of uh, running an architecture practice from one of my clients and it's that Real enjoyment over that, uh, over those types of um, those types of occasions, those types of engagements, uh, those types of attributes to what I'm doing now that uh, that really sustain me. Maybe a better way to phrase my question is: it Sounds like being an entrepreneur has brought out the best in you, and you're doing you know things you enjoy and doing things well and learning new skills. Yes, yeah. In a short way of answering your question, yes. <laughs> <laughs> And that's one of the hidden passions. What and why I love doing about being an entrepreneur too is you get to know your clients. Like you said, you're learning new fields you wouldn't normally learn about architecture, the architecture business. I've got some clients I work with in the accounting software industry and banks. I work with banks and I know more about those sectors than I ever thought I would <laughs> just from doing some content marketing work. With them. You know, you get to know your clients and it's kind of fun and challenging and enlightening, expanding our universe. Just watching the clock here, too. A couple of questions, more fun questions for you, maybe. How do you balance your personal life and, and business demands, especially when you've got a self-employed spouse? Flexibility, being flexible to certain degrees. What I'm inflexible about is maintaining uh, physical activity. That's a huge thing for me, biking, and making sure that physical fitness aspect, it's inflexible in terms of making sure that I'm carving out time in my day every day for that activity. I want to ask you about that though. So hang, hang on a sec. So you've got a big client deadline or the clients on the phone. Do you give in or do you go for that run? <laughs> That's where the flexibility comes in. And certainly if something comes up ad hoc that needs response, then I'm absolutely there for that. Where things can be sort of planned in advance and, and, and structured. And that's how I take care of it uh, most times. But uh, uh, but certainly, if uh, that that is one aspect that uh, is non negotiable in my days, uh, when it happens in the day, it is a bit flexible. That's where the flexibility comes in. But that's that's a big aspect uh, for me in helping manage the demands. As they say, entrepreneurs enjoy a lot of flexibility in their schedule. They can choose to work any twelve hours in a day they want. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sometimes 16. <laughs> but that's a real joy is being able to do what you love. Sounds like you're being true to yourself. And that's important, too. You can't get so lost in self-employment that client work first and you forget your mental and physical health. And you're, you're a good example of, of keeping that balance. And then on the creative side as well, uh, just reading and writing and having time for that is really important for me. That's important, too. Stimulate the mind. Relax. You're going to have to run soon, but a couple of quick questions. Tell me briefly, Nate, what do you love the most? Now that you've been in for two years, what do you love the most about self-employment? What do you hate? Maybe you can give me one of each. The word that 
immediately came to my mind on hearing your question was autonomy. I, I love the autonomy that I have. Now, with that comes responsibility, of course, but uh, but as a first reaction, what first came to my mind was the word autonomy. What I hate or what I'm challenged by is, you know, the feeling that I just still don't know enough. Somebody that uh, that is a mentor of mine, uh, that's an uh, executive coach, said that uh, as a coach, you are your client's ceiling. So when she said that to me, and this was a while ago, you know, over a year and a half ago, that that, that always stuck with me. And I try my darndest to bring that approach to my uh, engagements with my clients, making sure that I am bringing enough to them, enough value, enough expertise, um, you know, and so forth. You know, again, I'll, I'll characterize that as as a challenge rather than than something that I dislike. That challenge and that responsibility is what keeps me driving forward. But I'm always I'm always conscious of, of that of that challenge. Feeling like we don't know enough. And you know what? That's again, don't beat yourself up. I've been at this for 30 years and I still don't know much. Oh, geez, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's it's part of the journey. It's part of the journey. You learn stuff. And, you know, I got business books here. You can learn all kinds of stuff. It's part of the journey. Enjoy that journey. Accept the fact you know enough for the moment, I think. Obviously, you're doing well and, and you're going to learn as you go, right? Absolutely. And that that ties back into what I said much earlier in our discussion, Roger, about being curious and how that can help support the learnings that'll be important and transformational in how I can serve uh, my clients even better and 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 provide that um I'll say value proposition as another jargony term <laughs> to to prospects to get them curious about uh, what potentially I could help them with I love it such great answers and now I'm going to ask you for the, the the closing advice here so looking back on your 2 years What's your one piece of advice for someone who is Nate Simpson two years ago and thinking about getting into this themselves? Don't let planning get in the way of action. Okay. Can you explain that for me a little bit? How much time do you have? <laughs> is that paralysis by analysis? Because I suffer from that now and then. Yeah, it touches on the same theme. You know, I, I talked about being risk adverse and how I tried to mitigate risk to the extent that I could and, and, and so forth and in, in, in structuring things and setting things up. You know, if it's a, a new initiative or a new new client that I want to uh, engage with, and their prospect, and I'm seeing, you know, how you know, what's the best fit, and so on and so forth. And in other aspects, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stop myself from going down rabbit holes of individual examples. But in a similar fashion, I will want to make sure that I'm methodical in my approach to that opportunity, that I am structured and consider. The various attributes and things that that come into play when considering initiative X, but at a certain point, it does tip into that as as you made mention of that analysis uh, paralysis, but by analysis type of type of scenario where it's just like you just got to get going, progress over perfection, and just have a plan that you can stand behind and then get moving with it, and then with that experience as you act on that plan, as you engage with that plan, uh, you'll get inputs from that experience. And then and then you're just sort of in this process of evaluating and assessing and, and responding to those inputs and, and being informed by those by those actions and activities that, that come with getting underway with the doing of the things. Very insightful and very helpful. And thank you for opening up and sharing that, you know, and well, I think what you're saying is done is better than perfect, right? And you've got to just get out there and do it. I mean, software companies do this all the time, right, Nate? I mean, the big companies, they ship the software full of bugs that they know are there to get the, get the customer feedback, but also just to get the thing out there because they know they're going to make improvements, make improvements. So we got to stop beating ourselves up. It's never going to be a perfect business from the get-go. We're going to, and things shift and things change. And you thought one thing was going to happen, but it didn't. So you pivot. That's, that's the life, right? And then, uh, yeah, and then when you're getting that feedback and having those experiences, so that's where the network comes back into play. And that's where your professional associations come into play is that uh, you can rely on them for, uh, for advice and input uh, if there's something that uh, comes up in an experience that um, may be just beyond uh, the horizon of your capacity to address. That's where having that wide network can be a real benefit. 
lean on others, advisors and mentors and colleagues. And also, I should say as well, uh, you know, in addition to SMPS, which I noted before, uh, there's, uh, you know, different other resources for anybody that uh, is curious about business development and, and all of that type of thing. Uh, one, one that I've really enjoyed was the Business Development Podcast hosted by uh, Kelly Kennedy, uh, based out of Edmonton, Alberta. So that's one that I would encourage, whether you're in business development or marketing or, you know, senior leadership or heck, even, uh, you know, somebody early in your career at any firm. It doesn't have to be architecture, engineering or construction sector. But uh, if you have a curiosity about uh, aspects of business development, that's uh, that's a resource that uh, that I've leaned on, as well as the Society for Marketing Professional Services. Good plugs. I love it. I love people when they love it when people share resources. That's great. Well, listen, I think, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. I want to thank you, Nate Simpson, very much for sharing your entrepreneurial journey and experiences. You've given us a lot of good content here. I really appreciate it. And I think you've helped, helped entrepreneurs who are, who are going to be thinking about taking this journey themselves. So thank you very much. You're very welcome, Roger. Thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it very much. One last favor, if someone wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way to connect? Email or website or? Nate at natesimpson.ca or find me on LinkedIn. Excellent. Super. And to our listeners, thank you for being here and be sure to return again for more insights from The Unsure Entrepreneur. That's it for now. That's it for this episode of The Unsure Entrepreneur podcast. Thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss other candid conversations with small business owners. And be sure to check us out at unsureentrepreneur.com.